Hi, everybody. Um, it's a little too loud. Uh, so my name is Maribel Marrero Colon. I work with the Center for Applied Linguistics. For those of you who weren't in my last session, just very quickly, I am a 37-year veteran of the classroom. Uh, one thing I didn't mention before, which was really cool, I am not an education major. I did not come into education 37 years ago um, voluntarily. I was a forensic psychology major. Could not get any financial aid towards my master's. So uh, they offered me, a, uh, this is before Title III, there was Title VII. They offered me a free master's degree in bilingual special education, a job making 5,000 a year more than I was making. So I'm like, fine, I'll do that for a couple of years, then I'll come back. 37 years, I'm still here. <laughs> the kids grab you and they don't let go. So um, I have worked, as I said, bilingual special education, special education, bilingual ed, ESL, you name it, I've taught it. Every single grade from pre-K special ed through adults. I've worked in various universities in teacher prep programs. And what I do now is I'm the associate director of PD for the Center for Applied Linguistics. And I travel the country working with teachers of second language learners as well as students of every category. So I may have left special ed, but special ed didn't leave me. So let's talk about, this is a relatively new topic, even for me, this is something that I've only been working with for the past year and a half or, uh, or two. And it came up because it made sense to me that if I have a second language learner who is duly identified as needing assistance because of a disability, how do I reach them when many times learning disabilities, the problems have to do with how do we process language? Many of our LD kids have a problem processing language. So what happens when you add a second language to it? So let's do a really quick think pair share. I want you to stop and think about these three questions. Have you heard the term translanguaging before today? If you heard it an hour ago, that doesn't count. <laughs> if yes, how do you define it? And have you considered using translanguaging with duly identified students? Meaning students who have an IEP and are second language learners. Take a minute, turn and talk to someone near you. Uh, if you were with our group last time, try and talk to someone who you didn't talk to before. So let's take a minute. Okay. So now I'm gonna challenge you to share something that your partner said that may have caught your attention. So who would like Okay, great. We're going to be using the microphone because it's easy for the gentleman who's uh, videotaping. So I was just going to say that um, even though translanguaging wasn't a word, that like a vocabulary word that we have been using, um, one of my compatriots here said that they use it all the time because they're using the vocabulary that the students have. Good point. Great point. Who else would like to share <laughs> something their partner said? That's how I get the kids to, to listen to each other. They all listen to me, but they don't listen to each other. So who, would like to, who else would like to share something that their partner said? Or something you heard that kind of caught your attention? We're going to be coming back to you. We're going to go on, and we're going to come back to you. OK. Now, we're going to take another minute. We handed out. We, did we hand out the handouts? Yes. Okay. These handouts have also been uploaded to the site, so please don't be afraid to write on them. I know people get handouts and then they hold them and they'll write on them. Be my guest. They're on the website. You can download them along with the slides. Uh, the slides have been put as a handout on the website. So I put an anticipation guide with eight questions. Take a minute. Fill it out. And then we're going to come back to it at the end. 
Hold on to these. We're going to come back and revisit them at the end. So we talked about this. We talked about data, and we talked about the importance of data. One of the most important pieces of data is that not all second language learners in this country are Spanish speakers. It is true that 61% of our second language learners in this country are Spanish speakers, but that still leaves quite a few other languages. So the United States is home to people who represent multiple languages and cultural backgrounds. There are between 350 and 430 other languages spoken in this country. What this map shows is what languages are the most prevalent in different states of the country. And it's really interesting taking a look at, at some of these. For example, we have California and Nevada, the second language, top language is Tagalog. Or Vietnamese in Oregon. So they forgot Hawaii here. Ilocano is one of them, and I happen to know that Chuki is another one. Uh, and Marshallese in Hawaii. So it was kind of weird walking into uh, a school system to do a training where not one person spoke Spanish, except for me. Uh, if you take a look, some of these are even more. I was really surprised. Albany, New York, number one language is Thai. New York, really? OK, so it's really important to stop and think. And why does it say 350 to 430? They're like, don't you know how many languages you have? because we have a lot of indigenous languages, some of which have written components, some of which do not. For example, Kechi has become one of the most uh, widely used uh, indigenous languages coming into the United States. It has no written component. So we need to change our definition of literacy. So stop and think, if you have a student who comes into your classroom speaks a language that has no written component, and then they tell you, oh, he must be special ed. Why? Just because my language doesn't have a written component that we are an oral literacy country or area, does that mean I can't handle the content? Stop and think about that. Because right away, those kids who can't read and write, because we assume that they're illiterate. They're not illiterate. There's just a different definition of literacy. Plus, these 430 can include Creoles, Patois, and other languages that may be more symbolic that are not considered official languages. Right up until nine years ago, Haitian was considered a Creole. It was just nine years ago that the UN accepted it as a full language. And that's the other thing. They may speak languages that are not accepted by the UN yet as a full language. So we have to stop and think about all of the languages that are coming in to our classrooms. And here, now we have the new one, uh, which is really hitting. I've worked with a lot of teachers, like from Maryland and from Kentucky who uh, are running into this problem, they're running into the problem of kids coming into their classrooms who speak an indigenous language, in, but they come from a Spanish-speaking country, so they think the kids speak Spanish, and they don't. That's a big issue. You got a kid who arrives. They tell you he's from Guatemala. He doesn't speak Spanish. And everybody's like, what? doesn't speak Spanish. So I have no other resource to help that kid. So that's why knowing the languages. So however, when linguistically diverse families arrive in this country, they're faced with the task of learning English rapidly in order to be successful. The average child takes five to seven years to learn their home language. How much time do we give our English learners? Two to three years? Which, I don't know about you, I don't think it's fair. I give my kid who's born here, who's an English speaker, five to seven years to become dominant in English, but the kid coming brand new from another country, who might be nine, 10, 11 years old, 
isn't given that five to seven years. So we know as families come in, we need to learn English quickly. Although learning English is complex and difficult, can we all agree to that? Yeah, it is difficult. The same, uh, it's the language that gives us two letters, O-U, with ten different sounds. I mean, honestly, really? Why can't O-U just have one sound? Why can't F just be F? Does it have to be G-H, P-H, and F? Come on. So, you know, research shows that uh, multilingual learners may take five to seven years to acquire overall cognitive proficiency in English. We know this from the work of Jim Cummings. He started this in 1984. Yes, it takes five to seven years, but that's actually not true. It should be noted that five to seven years only applies to those kids who are on grade level in their home language. Students who are slight, students with limited or interrupted formal education, students with a learning disability, okay? Don't take five to seven years to become academically proficient in English. They could take anywhere from seven to 10 years to become proficient. Holy moly. And how many years did I say that the government gives us? Three, with a waiver, four, another waiver, five. After that, the school district's gotta pay for it themselves. Okay, so let's take a look at this. While the number of English learners in classrooms continues to increase, okay, we've got right now 4.963 million English learners in this country. Okay, by the way, in 2019, pre-COVID, it was over 5 million. We lost a lot of kids to dropouts, to COVID, to graduation, we actually had some of the highest graduation rates to passing proficiency tests. And these numbers do not include bilingual students who speak two languages in the home but always went to school in English, like me. These numbers do not include former English learners because the minute you pass that proficiency test, you're off the list as far as your data is concerned. This does not include kids in parochial schools and more and more parochial schools are developing ELL programs. I just did a workshop uh, to a couple of Catholic schools, but their numbers aren't included. This does not include private charter schools, public charter schools it does. And this does not include parents who have opted out. So the numbers are probably closer to 5.1 million in actuality. Okay, so then we have a question here. How do I best assist my second language learners to acquire and develop English skills while at the same time addressing content area and literacy needs? Shoot, this is are regular English learners. Now let's add a disability. Okay, one strategy is translanguaging. So here's the definition. Somebody asked me for a precise definition in the back over there. I think Pittsburgh did. Pittsburgh Steelers asked for a precise definition. Translanguaging refers to the language practices of bilingual or multilingual individuals. That comes from Ophelia Garcia. It includes discourse where individuals speak to each other in one language or another. It includes simultaneous use of two or more languages, engaging everyone in conversation, whether they are familiar with all languages represented or not. And remember, in that aspect, we have multiple levels of literacy. We have oral literacy, but we also have reading, writing, listening, and speaking as literacy is defined in the United States. Okay, the practice emphasizes the participants' flexible use, notice the word flexible, flexible use of their complex linguistic resources. Why? Because I don't care what language you speak, it's a complex system. 
even if we look at the standards, all of our standards say the kids have to learn to use sophisticated levels of language, which means complex and abstract. Okay, so those complex linguistic resources to make meaning of their lives and their communication. How are they communicating? Okay, here's an example. Um, family getting together, they're setting up a Christmas feast. Anybody here want to read in Spanish with me? I don't want to do all the reading. Anyone want to try? Great. So you can be uh, the first person. Who would like to be the second person? I could be the third. Okay. So I'll be the third. So why don't you start us off? Okay, ¿qué necesitas? Here's the sofrito, ¿qué más? Michelle, búscale las anzuelas a tu tío. Tío, I found the beans. Which ones do you want? ¿Quieres las rojas o las pintas? Give me the red ones. Tía, ¿necesitas el vinagre o just the oil? Los dos hijos, Manuel, take the chicken out of the oven. Okay, okay, no me ahorre. Tío, todo tiene un color estupendo. Okay, this is a regular everyday family discussion where people are going back and forth in multiple languages. Do you hear this in the classroom? Do you hear this with families? All the time. And here's the thing, it doesn't matter which language you're speaking, it happens in all languages. Your house happens in three. So it really is just everyday conversation. I used to work, I used to have colleagues who used to get upset that if somebody walked in and spoke Spanish, I would continue speaking in Spanish to them and they get upset about it. <laughs> Why? We just did it automatically and then both of us switched back to English. It's just something people do. It's communication. It's just everyday language. It's like using formal English versus conversational English. Don't you hear kids do that all the time in the classroom? They're explaining photosynthesis and then they turn to me and say, what's up, man? Because it's conversational. And it's conversational fluency, which is the first thing students develop. But what happens when we're talking about formal English in the classroom? Because let's face it, none of us speak academic English outside of school which makes every single student in your classroom an English learner. I used this example before. You don't hear kids at the mall talking about the Pythagorean theorem. Do they sit down and speak algebra while they're uh, eating uh, Chinese food or pizza? On the city bus, do you hear them talking about the American Revolution and why the colonists declared their independence? <coughs> no. Which means that every single student, whether they're an English learner or not, or they're a multilingual learner or not, is learning English, academic English. Well, I was just thinking, because the first question asked me when you're away from school. Sorry. Okay. It asked about when you're away from school, but I'm thinking the hallways in the cafeteria aren't the same as in the classroom either. That's right. Because people are conversational there too. Yeah, only if they're really worried about the test next period. Right. <laughs> That's the only time I've ever heard kids speak algebra is in the hallway right before the test. Or right after. <laughs> because they, they're trying to figure out, did I get question five right? Absolutely. So translanguaging represents an approach to language instruction. And, and these are really super important. Affirms and leverages students diverse and dynamic language practices. In other words, we're using what the kids know and bring with them. We use the kids' funds of knowledge in the classroom. I had a kid came into my classroom. She was 13, brand new from Dominican Republic. She knew, one, uh, she knew how to say one thing in English when she came in. She knew how to say good morning. And then she would break out crying. Most people, I would say the first couple of weeks of school, most people treated her like she knew nothing. Except one thing. She had a college reading level in Spanish. 
She's the only kid I've had in 37 years who could read Macbeth in Spanish. At 13, she had already read 100 Years of Solitude, Cien Años Soledad. She's the only kid I ever had who ever read Pablo Neruda before the age of 13. I didn't read any of that. She had read Quixote at 13. I didn't read any of that before college. So she had a lot of funds of knowledge to bring in. I mean, her math was practically non-existent, but her reading was phenomenal. And she had all these funds of knowledge to bring into the classroom. And if we didn't, can you imagine how sad it would have been if we didn't let her use her home language to help her learn English? I, kn I had people, first couple of weeks, they're like, does she have a learning problem? I'm like, no, she's scared of you. <laughs> because you keep yelling at her and raising your voice. You ever notice that everybody tries to raise their voice when a person doesn't speak English? And by the way, that's a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just in the United States. That is a worldwide phenomenon. I saw a really cute video in France of these guys practically yelling at an American <laughs> who, who didn't speak French. So we have to affirm and leverage what the students know, what they're able to do. Translanguaging as a pedagogy means that the teacher is aware of the capabilities of their students. We have to get to know our kids. We have to know what they bring with them. The one kid in the world that I ever had in my 37 years who knew more about the constellations didn't know how to write his name. But he knew the name of every single constellation and where to find them, both in the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. He couldn't write his name. I taught him how to write his name at the age of 16. And he wasn't an English learner. So we have to really look at what do the kids bring with them. And we have to get to know our kids. Is it easy? No. Elementary, it's a little bit easier because if you have 30 kids, you have 30 kids for the whole year. If you're teaching high school, you might have a, anywhere from 50 to 100 to 200 kids, depending where you're working. So is it easy? No. But we need to get to know our kids so that we know how to use what they know to help them progress. Because guess what? Who's still going to get blamed if the kids don't do well? OK, so the teacher knows that he or she can tap into student knowledge base and capabilities as a resource. And that home language is a resource. And it's really important. And we can't assume that that home language is down here academically. Ask any, you all know what a novela is? You know it's a Spanish soap opera? OK. Ask any kindergartner who speaks Spanish and ask them, what did the protagonist do in the novela last night? You're laughing because you know that they're going to answer it. OK. They're going to say, protagonista, and they'll tell you everything that happened and what the protagonist did and the antagonist did. Would a native English speaking child know what a protagonist and antagonist is in kinder? No. But in Spanish, it's a high frequency word, which means this child who's down here academically is actually up here. So we can't assume that a second language learner is Academics are always down here. We have to stop and think, what do they know? That language base. And if that child has a learning disability, are we using that basic knowledge to help them come up? Because if my kid has a learning disability, but he knows what a protagonist and antagonist is, boy, am I going to use that information when we're doing character analysis. Because I'm going to start comparing to the novela what's going on. And then I'm going to tell you to the rest of my kids what a novella is in English. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily a telenovela, but you know. Absolutely. There was a question last session. To this slide, I would say, when there, you're saying, OK, so does that just mean we need to tell the classroom teacher to talk to the family? Uh, step two of our procedures of screening, identification, and placement is family interview. This Absolutely. is where I push that if you have not seen what your district family interview looks like, 
you should get your eyes on it. You know that those five or seven questions that we suggest as PDE, you are as a district to expand upon those. Gather the most rich data you can, and that data shouldn't just be held in an administrative office somewhere. It needs to make it to the classroom level to be able to That's start right. this out. And so not just once having that interview, but following up because of trust. But I, that's where that connection is of that family interview. Not only that, but that's a really great source to find out if that youngster is having the same academic difficulties in the home language. That's right. Great question to ask. That is a great question to ask. Do they have trouble reading and writing in their home language? Have they been exposed? Have they ever been to school? Remember, 70% of all English learners in the United States were born in this country. So they've never been to school. Well, it'd be nice to ask a parent, has he ever been to school in another country, in another language? I have a colleague who works with, in my office. She actually went to Polish school every day of her life until she graduated high school. She went every weekend to Polish school. So she was a full bilingual. And nobody in her schools knew it. So it's really important to tap into that information. It's also a really good time to ask a parent who will nine times out of 10 hide it, has your child ever needed special services in school? Has he ever been identified with a disability? Does your child have an, uh, my parents always used to say no and I'm like, did he ever have an IEP? Oh yeah, I have a copy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because they'll hide it, because they figure, okay, new country, new, uh, new beginning. No, there's no such thing in new beginning if you've already been identified as having a disability. And that's the other thing, you're, only dis you're disabled in both languages, not just one. I had a principal who wanted me to put down that the kids were disabled in English. I'm like, I can't do that, he reads on grade level in Spanish. <laughs> okay, translanguaging creates a bridge. Part of the, the job of translanguaging is to create a bridge that's systematic and which helps students comprehend content completely. One language is used to teach the concept and the skills during that lesson or at the close of the unit. We make sure that the kids comprehend in both languages. So let's say I taught a whole lesson on the water cycle. At the end of that, I'm going to say, oh yeah, Juan, tu entendiste? Explícamelo. And let them explain to me. Right there I can tell if they understood the water cycle in one language, they're going to understand it in the other. And now I can put it on my little checklist, he got it. But if he starts telling me something that's totally off base, I'm going to have to go back and see what's going on academically. So the translanguaging helps figure it out. If needed, application unit in other language should follow. OK, he really didn't understand my, uh, my lesson on the water cycle. Let me teach it to him in his home language, or let me see if I can find a video that will teach it in the home language, or talk to the parent to teach it in the home language, find the para who can help me, somebody, because I need to know, is it the content he doesn't understand, or it's the language? he or she doesn't understand. Because if it's a language, hey, we can get around that. We can come up with different ways. But if it's the content concepts, then we've got a problem we have to address. OK, uh, here's an example. Mrs. Simpson is a fifth grade general ed teacher, assigns her students independent reading books for which they need to complete a written report. You all remember doing that, the book reports? God, didn't you hate those? Especially when they made you stand in the front of the room and do it. Okay, well, she's giving them a book report. She allows her students to use their stronger home language as a scaffold. Because remember, translanguaging in a system where your, lingu uh, your language of instruction is English, you're using the home language as a scaffold. And the most important part of scaffolding is removal of the scaffold at the end. So if we're letting them use their home language as a scaffold, then you know what? We've got to come back to English at the end. So Mrs. Simpson's letting her kids uh, use uh, their home language as a scaffold. Okay, she lets them read their books in English. 
but they can take notes and make their annotations in their home language. I annotate in Spanish when I don't understand something. I'll start taking notes in Spanish in the margin right away. Have group discussions in the language that they're most comfortable with, but all the answers and summaries come back to the whole group in English. So you guys can talk all you want. I don't care what language you talk. But when you're reporting back to the whole class, what language am I going to ask for? English. English. OK? And then first drafts are written in the home language if the kids want to. I've had kids write them in both languages, which is really confusing to me, not to them. But they're not allowed to translate. They have to actually take all that information and rewrite it so that it makes sense. Because translation doesn't work. Translation helps, but it doesn't work as the form of instruction. Teachers who try to translate the whole chapter in a book are really not helping the kid or themselves. All they get, they're going to get is a migraine. However, if I take three sentences that are the key part of that paragraph and translate it, but the rest of the reading is in English, that might help if there's a comprehension problem. Okay, and that sounds great for the regular tier one classroom, right? We've been talking MTSS, tier one, we get it. What happens if a kid is duly identified as being a second language learner with disabilities? Turn and talk to uh, your partner and ask each other, have you ever had a student with, who's identified as having a learning disability or having a problem, but is also a second language learner. Maybe you didn't have him, but maybe he's a student in your school. Turn and talk to each other. Anybody want to share your discussion? Our discussion was pretty quick. I know. Help me out here. I said our discussion was pretty quick because all, well, three of us said yes. We, we do have uh, ESL students who are identified special ed. Uh, Those are hard kids to work with. Y yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to actually put you on the spot uh, because you brought up a really. Oh, wait, we're coming this way. Okay. All right, let me go this way. No, they'd like me to walk across the room like this. Stay in the so we have a strong Nepali population in our school, and I, we have several students who are identified with learning disabilities and speak a different language as their home language. So one little boy particularly, like he'll just stare at people and people are like, I think he has a higher disability. But I wonder if he has trouble understanding English and the content we're teaching him. And instead of digging deeper, I feel like a lot of times it's like, oh, well, he has an older sister and she could speak English. But all kids are different, so it'd be interesting to look in those dynamics more. Yeah, and what if she came to this country first and he came later? Right. That's why I would love to have a conversation with the parents about that. Um, so the additional part of that, I'm a school counselor in elementary school, so I'm not always doing the lessons, but um, I do have students who um, are dual. and. The biggest part that I usually see where I'm able to try to provide support is their emotions in response to all of what is happening. They are trying to learn this language, new to a school, new to the country, and trying to make friends, you know, and I think a lot of us are like, that, that silence is awkward for a lot of people, so if you ask a question and we're like, you know, let's give them a chance to respond, because they're processing what you said in English and in their own language, it's they're, everybody's uncomfortable, you know, so then they hurry them along. But then the child, they do cry, you know, that is yeah. very emotional. They are often stressed or feeling overwhelmed. Um, and we try to support them. That's a, a thing our school's working on as well, how we can support them emotionally um, because they're struggling. Yeah. And sometimes they know the answer and they cry because they don't have the language to explain the answer, even though they know it. There's a really, I'm, I'm not allowed to give it out, but please look it up on YouTube. There's a really great video about a little boy named Moises. Has anybody seen yes. it? Moises is a wonderful, wonderful video. I love that video. Um, that you can access through YouTube. 
and it's about a little boy who's a second language learner who knows a lot of math and can't get the message across. So it's a really great video to, to look at. And look at the long version. The short version is not as satisfying. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to say I always show that video to any time I give a professional development or to new teachers. I even show it to my college students just so they can have a little bit of empathy and just see what it's like through the eyes of an L. And it really is eye-opening for a lot of people. So I highly recommend that video. Yep. So it's, it's won awards. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's a wonderful it's video. Fabulous. And one of the things that I love about that video is that teachers who normally complain about English learners after they see it, they're really frustrated with his teacher when they're exactly the same. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's really interesting because he is more than capable of handling the work. But I can see him where he says, be put into a special ed program real easily. I also think that oh, I'm sorry. I also just want to mention in that video which is which is great. Also it shows how his family got here and the that social emotional piece and how big that is when a student's coming. It's not just the academic, it's the social emotional is just as just as important. And yeah. I think Jen and teachers get frustrated with having ELs in their classroom because they're so worried about the, yeah. the academic language and they don't have it and they're not doing this. And I think just be, they don't understand that. Give them a minute, give them time. I think we forget the Bix. Like when we have our own personal children, we don't teach them out of the womb, like knowing all that academic language. It's personal, interpersonal skills. And I think sometimes they need to take that step back and be like, we need to help them socially and acclimate them mm -hmm. here and make sure that they're happy and we're kind and other kids are kind and that will all come in play mm -hmm. and you're not going to lose your teaching degree if they don't score well in the state standards. <laughs> like there's enough data to prove like calm well. down kind of thing, you know, <laughs> like it will all come. I think everybody's just so overwhelmed by the, the data and the scores and we, we forget that there's still little beings and we still have to help them and they're still here to learn. Um, they have so much to give, but just bring it down a notch, I think, yeah. sometimes, too. And on the other side of that, don't let them fall through the cracks. If there is a learning problem, we need to find it, we need to identify it, we need to give the interventions. I will share a personal story. I am an adult with a learning disability. I was not identified as being dyscalculic, which if some of you may have gone to that, that session this morning about dyscalculia, I was not identified until I was 25 years old, which meant that I went through my entire school life, including a bachelor's and half of a master's, struggling and crying every day. And so I was a kid who fell through the cracks. Why? Because I was a second language learner. My parents were told that I was having learning problems because we spoke two languages at home. First and only time I ever saw my father uh, disrespect the teacher, but I'm so happy he did. But he made sure uh, that I learned to read and write in Spanish because of that. But I needed help. I needed a resource room. I needed something and didn't receive it. And whatever I did receive was done without parental consent. Because I did get some help in the fifth grade. My parents knew nothing about it. So... You know, we have to stop and think about this. So traditionally, U.S. schools have been, uh, have been categorized into subgroups, right? We always put kids in subgroups. You know, not accepted as part of general ed. Title I students. There was a time when being called a Title I student <laughs> was a really bad thing until they attached money to it. Now it's a good thing. Okay? You know, stop and think about, oh, he's at risk. What does that mean? At risk of what? I love at-risk kids. I never know what I'm helping them with because I don't know what they're at risk for. So we have to really stop and think. These include categorizations as what? English learners or English language learners or multilingual learners. Now we have you know, long-term L's, forever L's. That's another new one. Students with limited or interrupted formal education, slight. Some school districts call them SIF, students with interrupted formal education. We like categorizing kids. And by the way, the reason we actually categorize kids is for money, not, not for any other reason. 
Likewise, students with disabilities are often separated from those students. So now we've got all these. Now we had a learning disability. Let's separate them some more. OK? Should a student be identified as an English learner with a disability, he or she is categorized even more. And we look at it from a deficit point of view. We forget all of the positive things those kids can do. And, and now we separate them. OK, so if you take a look at this deficit model, this uh, should be in your handout. Uh, we have special ed in tier one, special ed self-contained, EL services, sheltered instruction. We have EL, ESL, LD, SP, and Lang, meaning speech and language, at risk, low performance, English only, ESL, pull out, push in, sheltered, immersion, no L1 allowed, monolingual instruction. I knew somebody who actually got written up for using the first language in the classroom. We keep separating kids. And it, see, you know, it, it seems ridiculous and frustrating, but that's exactly what we do. So why use translanguaging then with kids with disabilities? <coughs> we look for a way to help kids bridge between two languages. We look for ways to support students so that they can learn the content. Because content and language need to come together. I've had a lot of people say, Madi, wait a minute. Why don't we just teach them English and then teach them all the content? And that kind of makes sense, right? In a logical po point of view. But here's the problem. If we taught the language, and then taught the content, the average high schooler would be 38 years old before they get a high school diploma. Remember I talked that five to seven years, that seven to 10 years? Well, we're assuming the kid coming in is coming in, in kindergarten, first, second grade. What about the 16 year old who comes in? What about the ninth grader that if there's a difficulty, has actually three years to learn, 12 years worth of learning? as well as all of the modifications that they need to be able to overcome a disability. On top of that, language. It can't be done. Realistically, it can't be done. We have to teach content and language together. So how are we going to do it? Translanguaging is a beneficial practice for students considered, here we go again, that categorization, at risk because of the flexibility of language practices involved. If we translanguage and allow students to use more than one language to learn the content, we're giving their brains a flexible way of looking at content. We're using the knowledge they have, we're using the, the language they're strong with to bridge to learning that content in English. Yes, ma'am. I don't know. I just feel like um, this isn't complicated. It's like adding pictures to help with a story, yes. right? Yep. Like it helps you visualize and get the understanding, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But a lot of people, again, like to keep everything separate. Right. Like the person who says that if we give kids scaffolds, it's cheating. If we differentiate, we're hurting kids because they're not learning the actual content. That's what people like to say. Is it true? No. Yeah, it's not factual, right? No, because when you meet kids where they're at, you're giving them the tools to be able to build up. And that's what translanguaging does. It gives them those tools. Students with disabilities often have varying abilities. We all know that. <laughs> How many times have you had a kid with a disability who's fantastic at this and over here they are struggling to even get an equation written down? So they have varying abilities. And then giving them flexibility with the language they, uh, they have to learn how to write that equation. Well, now I'm giving them a tool.
So that flexibility in language afforded by translanguaging really helps the teacher. By the way, that's the word. It helps the teacher. We're helping that teacher, making their life a little bit easier, even though they think it's harder, to meet the student where he or she is at, adjust language, give them flexibility, give them a lighter load so they can learn. Because if you have to learn too much, kids shut down. Any kid, not just those who are duly identified. You give a kid too much, they're going to shut down. But if you give them a flexible approach to see the same thing in different ways, they're going to come back and they're going to do what they have to do. As well as the cognitive load, and that's the other piece, that thinking piece, the cognitive ability, the metacognitive skills. Because that's hard. And if you have a disability, you have a breakdown with the cognitive and the metacognitive. Okay, to meet the needs and strengths of the student. So I'm going to use what the kid does really well and use that in a way to help them. If you've got a kid with a really great listening comprehension, I've had kids who can't read a sentence, but they can argue the merits of whether or not Thutmose uh, should have had the throne of Egypt instead of Hatchetson. I've actually had that happen in my classroom. Because their listening comprehension is so good that they understand the content. Well, now that I know they understand the content, now I'm going to tackle language. Does that make sense? You had your hand up. Yeah, I just feel also like um, being able to speak in your language that you use at home and that being okay in the classroom is a way to be culturally accepting too. Yes. And so requiring that you must speak English or whatever is kind of like a, a refusal or a denial of that. And you don't validate them as a human being. Right, right. Yep. I just feel like we're, there's the, the um, cultural competence aspect of it as well in terms of yeah. in addition to the instructional piece. That's that why we about. don't look at it from a deficit model. We look at it from an asset what they bring with them, and we work with our teachers, and we work in training, and we work through PLCs, and we work through having conversations in the teacher's room. You know, some of the best conversations I've ever had with teachers are in the teacher's lounge. And we bring it up and we discuss it. Maribel, can I just say, yeah. as I move throughout the state, I'll say, like, to us, it's like, duh. But what I hear from teachers across the state is the reason, because all we're saying is invite the home language in your classroom. Mm -hmm. It's scary for teachers because what I don't speak that language. I don't understand it. I don't know what they're talking about. And so talking about translanguaging for me, mm -hmm. Maribel, you being here, is giving permission for us to go out and giving teachers permission, y allow it in the classroom. And we're going to help you to understand ways on how, because it's really the teacher's problem, it's not the student's problem. And so giving teachers the tools. So that's what I hear across, why would I, I don't speak their language, why would I allow it in the classroom? Not only that, it builds the trust. I get teachers when they say, I don't know that language, I don't know what the kid's talking about. I get that, okay? I have sat in classroom where I've heard kids talk about the teacher behind their back in their own language, and I've stopped the conversation as a visitor in the room. I get that. But if we build the trust, and if we build that sense that you're validating me as a human being, you're validating my culture, you're validating my language, you're saying that I'm important, <coughs> I'm not going to talk about you behind your back. Right. I'm not going to do that. I am going to do what you expect me. Plus, it also has to do with really good and deliberate lesson planning. Because I don't give two minutes of free time in my classroom, ever. They don't get that. I'm like, I'm done, good, come here, I got the next piece for you. I'm like, really? <laughs> Can I have a minute? I'm like, no. I'm like, okay, fine, uh, New York minute, 50 seconds. You know, um, because we have to do it. And you're right, we need to validate. We need to have them feel good. We need to make things asset-based, that what I have to say as an adult is important as a teacher, and what you have to say as a student and bring to this classroom is important. And what you bring with your own language is important. And you know what? The ability to say, 
Yo, mister, I don't understand what you're doing. Can you please come here and help me? It's just as important. So, you know, freedom, and there's that word, uh, I guess what we're talking about, freedom that they're offered to bring their language and practices and use their bilingual voices opened up in spaces <coughs> of learning. Teachers careful planning, and that's where this comes down. It has to do with planning of integration and making sure that things come in. So the use of translanguaging contributes to learning experiences that allow students to actually drive the lesson. They're not sitting back bored. They're driving the lesson while still meeting the prescribed goals. Again, I'm a SIA person, so I believe in content and language objectives. And how do we meet those objectives and how do we make sure that the kids know how to meet them? And that's where I stick in what I know I'm going to be scaffolding with those kids. Translanguaging paired with the culture of linguistic inclusion, which is what you're talking about. You know, creating more collaborative and inclusive approach. So what does our inclusive design include? <laughs> okay, collaboration with the teacher. We're going to work together. EL services. That e if, I don't care if you're teaching a self-contained special ed. That EL teacher needs to be part of the team. <coughs> if I'm doing MTSS, that EL teacher is going to be in there talking to us about language. If we're doing an IEP meeting, that EL teacher needs to be in there prescribing. If I'm writing IEP goals, then I'm going to make sure they're culturally and linguistically appropriate for the kids. That EL teacher is part and parcel of the entire team and the entire community. Services identified on IEPs. If we need to use translanguaging, put it on the IEP. If we're going to use translation, we put it on the IEP. If we're going to be using um, an electronic translator, it goes on the IEP. If I'm going to be using objectives, it's going to be there. If I'm going to target Bix and Calp, it's going to be on the IEP. Because that IEP is a legal document that forces the teacher to have to do that stuff. And we kind of forget, because a lot of teachers get an IEP and it goes up on the, on the shelf and it gathers dust. Not in my school. First thing I'll do is when I walk into the teacher, so pull out the IP, let's take a look. Here are the scores from the last test, uh, proficiency test. Pull out the IP. let's make sure that the scores are on the t IP. It has to become a living, breathing document that the language pieces, linguistically and culturally appropriate goals in academic language, translanguaging as a support. Believe me, I have a lot of principals who would have shot me if I put translanguaging on an IP. Okay? Those I had to sneak them in. But once they're on there, boy, we had to do it. <laughs> and then collaboration with the family. We should never leave the family out. The family, and I got to tell you, teaching parents to ask about that IEP every time they talk to the teacher makes a difference. Every teacher in the school knew who, which parents I talked to. Every, every one of them. They're like, you've been talking to Maribel. You know, it's like, did, you, did Maribel call you last night? <laughs> And the parent like, no, I called her this morning. <laughs> you know, because the family's the one who makes sure that everything's done. Plus the fact, honestly, doors closed, good. Um, you know, the family are the only ones who have legal reprisals. They're the ones who can call a lawyer. <laughs> so where do we implement and use translanguaging with kids? You know, we make sure we have resources. You, if we have the kid in the resource room, whatever name they give it, because every state has different names for the old-fashioned resource room, inclusive classrooms, collaborative team teaching, self-contained special ed. In other words, we use it in every single program. Okay, here's an example. This is Mrs. Narvai. She's a seventh grade middle school health class. She teaches collaboratively with Mr. Sanchez and has a paraeducator because we need a one-to-one -one para. And Ms. Bag uh, Ms. Bagan and her class is comprised of 27 kids, 10 English learners, level 1 through level 4, 5, 17 native English speakers, 4 native English speakers, and 3 L's are duly identified. Eight of them receive tier 2 services. Three of them are awaiting evaluation for gifted and talented. Notice there's an EL in that group. Because the EL isn't always at the bottom, sometimes they're at the top. OK, 
Okay, Mrs. Narvaez is teaching a unit on the benefits of general health practices for promoting wellness and preventing disease. In other words, she's teaching health. Okay, the unit includes topics such as basic hygiene, hand washing, sleeping, exercise, hydration, balanced food choices, and sun protection. Isn't that great that now we add sun protection? <laughs> Students will do an experiment where they compare the health benefits of using a hand sanitizer versus hand washing with soap and water. That's actually one of the best labs you can ever do in a class. She's divided the class into sets of both homogeneous and heterogeneous group for language proficiency, literacy, and service delivery. So this is what she's got. She's got one group of English learners. She's got one group of gifted and talented with her English learner in there. She's got one group of English learners and native English speakers who go to tier two. She's got the ones that go to tier three. She's got the, uh, the ones who have IEPs, the English learners with IEPs. And then we have the native English speakers with IEPs meet with the paraeducator. Then we have tier one, regular ed, regular ed, and we have the EL teacher working with the uh, kids with the lowest EL. So this is deliberate grouping. Some groups are heterogeneous, some of them are homogeneous. The ones that need more language work with the EL teacher. The ones who need more literacy work with the paraeducator. And Ms. Narvaez actually works with everybody else. So it's very deliberate in her groupings. I'm running out of time, right? Yeah, Mary, I was terrible. I didn't give you your five minute, and we're oh. actually over time. Ah, it's okay. 419. Okay, so for everybody here, the, the rest of this um, PowerPoint has been uploaded as a handout. Uh, feel free to contact me at any time. I'm a resource for everyone. Just please keep in mind that one of the most important things is to make sure that you have a strong plan, translanguage deliberately, plan it out ahead of time, contact the parents, and make them involved in the process. Have a Thank great you. Day. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you.